Okay, so everybody, thank you very much for joining us today. We have a, an important and a special seminar. Uh, today, we, I'm honored to welcome back David Menashri. Professor Menashri is a professor emeritus at Tel Aviv University, and he was the founder of the Alliance Center for Iranian Studies at Tel Aviv University, the preeminent uh, research center on Iran, certainly in, this, in, in Israel and throughout the world. Uh, David is an internationally recognized scholar and lecturer of modern Iranian history, and he's um, also the author of many books, among them Education and the Making of Modern Iran, which was le actually recently published in Persian. Um, the unauthorized translation was published by Hakmat Sina and Iran's Supreme Council of the Cultural Revolution, which is certainly interesting. And it was presented as one of the most comprehensive and important books on the history of education in Iran. So that's quite an interesting accomplishment. And David has done work internationally dealing with anti-Semitism and the, the regime, and also played a key role for many years in helping ISGAP to uh, sustain and develop. So David, it's an honor to have you to speak today. Um, and the, the title of David's talk today is Iran, the U.S. and Israel, Maximum Pressure versus Maximum Resistance. So thank you, David. Thank you. Th thank you very much. It's good to be back, uh, Charles, with uh, ISGAP. The last time that I was on ISGAP, uh, it was broadcast on the Jewish television, and then the Iranian authorities used it, or parts of it, in broadcasts under, under the program they call what they say about us, and they quoted. Fortunately, they, they picked up, not bad from my perspective, sentences, but for them it was seeing how interesting we are, how the world is concerned about us, and so on and so forth. Uh, just a word about the book that you mentioned. It's, uh, it's not a small thing that the Council of Cultural Revolution, which is one of the most extreme uh, institutions in Iran, would pick up this book to translate and complement it the way they did. And even more, when I say the, the book that uh, the Cultural Revolution failed at the universities, they not only agreed, but they said the Cultural Revolution failed in many other areas. And this is the, the council that sponsored the publication of the book. What I mean by this is that Iran is a very complex country. And I beg you all, my dear friends, don't treat Iran as, a, I don't know, a crazy country, uh, a bunch of people who don't know what they are doing. They are running their policy in a very shrewd and sophisticated way. And they deserve much more, I don't want to say respect, but recognition that you are dealing with people who used to be a, an empire and still think about themselves, either successors of Cyrus the Great, 25 centuries back, or raising the flag of Islam or Shiite Islam in its peak times. So this is important for me to remember that Iran is a, is a very complex country. If I tell people that may, almost half of the Iranians are not Persians, they may be surprised. But again, there are so many ethnic minorities, there are so religious groups and so on and so forth. And within the policy body in Iran, we have different uh, camps, many of them. But let's say, just pick up two of them, more conservative, extremists, radicals on the one hand, and another group more pragmatic, uh, I would say even reformist, um, if you want, moderate groups. And we come to it in a, in a moment. Iran entered the year 2020 with many acute problems. The economy was in miserable situation, it still is even more. Unemployment, the uh, real, the currency 
has, is now in the deepest that it has been in history. Uh, it has gone through demonstrations from late 2017, again to late 2018, even in January, uh, just following the assassination of Qasim, General Qasem Soleimani, people tour to the streets and demonstrating on the, because of the, the government's failure to admit its role in downing the Ukraine airplane uh, in, I think it was January 4th or 5th or something like that, January 4th. So with all the side issues comes the corona which Iran has become the, the country in the Middle East which suffers most, more than any other country in the Middle East in the absolute number of people and in percentage in society. Uh, it's, uh, still, the economy is not crashing. When the Americans say this, they came with this policy of maximum pressure, the, the impression was that someone in, in New York, in Washington, thinks that with a bit more pressure, this, the economy collapse, would collapse and immediately after the regime itself would fall apart. This did not happen. I don't want to say it's not going to happen, but so far after from May, 2000, from May 2018 to May 2020, more than two years now, it's the economy is in miserable situation, but Iran is under sanctions from 1979 with the hostage crisis. So uh, I, again, they may collapse, but it's uh, so far they have learned to live with it. Maybe it's like antibiotic that you take antibiotic all the time, you become more, your body became immune to the sanctions. Now it's, uh, uh, now we are going here to what's going on after with the Corona. With the Corona, we see that the, uh, the, uh, the extremists, the radicals are gaining more and more power. In the election to the parliament, the uh, uh, pragmatists have been lost all, all their, almost all their seats in parliament. For the first time, we have a formal commander of the Revolutionary Guards serving as speaker of the parliament or standing at the head of one of the three branches of government. So the Revolutionary Guards, which was in miserable situation, just few months back in January, following the killing of Qasem Soleimani, it was in a bad situation. It was suppressing the people in their demonstrations against the regime. Now presents itself as savior of the people, cleaning the streets, and sending packages of food, and if Ira will be good enough, nice enough to show us this con the constructing situation that when you see, uh, that's the way the American, the Iranians present themselves as fighting on two fronts. They are fighting against the Corona and they're fighting against the United States. But the other slide that I wanted to show is the mausoleum of Imam Khomeini, the, the founding father of the Islamic revolution. Here you see, this is the grave of Ayatollah Khomeini. This mausoleum was cost to the Iranian people billions of dollars. This is the symbol of richness that doesn't exist in Iran. And then look at the packages of food that are putting their revolutionary guards packages to give to the people who don't have rice oil or whatever. And this caused resentment in Iran. Saying, someone wrote to the grandson of Ayatollah Khomeini, this picture is a shame to the family of Ayatollah Khomeini. We are not supposed to be in a situation that we will have so many poor as people in the country. 
but see the, con the construct between the richness and the misery of the people. And that's what we see in Iran. There are so many rich people at the time of people starving. So the potential of these economic, social issues leading to change exists. But when this can happen, we really, we really don't know. What we know that the Americans, the Iranians are blaming the, Ameri the United States for engineering the virus. Now for them, it's not the Chinese virus as the Americans say, it's the American virus. Engineers specifically, they said the way that says presented by Ayatollah Khamenei, engineers specifically to attack the Iranians based on their studies about the um, Iranians genuine, genuine. They learned the genealogy of the Iranians and prepared this to attack the specialty. That's why they didn't want to allow doctors, top doctors beyond borders to come. So we allow doctors, they will make this virus to stay forever. That's the way they present it. Now, as against the Americans maximum, uh, maximum uh, uh, pressure, the Iranians brought this slogan of maximum uh, resistance. And this is a slide that uh, I have the other one, and this will be done with the slide, the iron fist. That's the way the Iranians see. If you look at this iron fist, it shows it's everything is made with uh, military airplanes, tanks, and all kinds of military equipment. And this is the way Ayatollah Khomeini, this was on Ayatollah Khamenei's website, that we are going with your iron fist to break the power of the United States. And when it was published, just as the Iranians and the five plus one signed or agreed on the JCPOA. So even, even with, Ayatollah, uh, with, with uh, President Obama in the White House, that's what their attitude. We do the deal, we do from it what is good for us, but the call death to America Khamenei said himself, is part of the DNA of the Islamic revolution. It's not going to change. Now it seems to me a bit bizarre because if the Iranians ask themselves, which is the country that has made the greatest service to Iran's national interest, I can, I'll, I'll surprise you. It's the United States of America. In 1991, America went at the head of a coalition to smash the military power of the enemy number one of Iran, Saddam Hussein. In 2002, they went to the eastern border, eastern wing of, of Iran to crash the military power of the enemy number two, the Taliban in Afghanistan. The 2003, another coalition removed Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And even today, the, the nuclear deal was the best gift the Iran could have received. And today the policy of the Iranian, of the Americans playing to the hands of the, of the Iranians. One example, there, was, there are signs that the two countries are speaking, you know, that the impression that there is no talks between the two countries, it's not for serious. Iran accepted prime minister in Iraq that, that is considered close to the United States, out of no choice, not because of love. Afghans are speaking Iran, Iran and Iran and uh, uh, the United States are speaking together about the Taliban in Afghanistan and they are meeting together, officials in the two countries. We have a, uh, approval of a statement by a leading American diplomat uh, Under Secretary of the uh, UN, that she says that Ira Iran and America are speaking together about the Houthis, and Iran is positively re responding. And then there was a swap of of prisoners, and see what happens. 
The swap was the Iranians meant that it, we want to exchange prisoners. That's all. The Americans tried to engage them in larger dialogue and they did not agree. And then you see the, the president of the United States actually calling them to come and have good deal because as he said, you can get a better deal with us. Well, that's, I think that for the Iranians is a sign of weakness of the United States. The Americans, they said it publicly. The Americans are threatening, but they are afraid to act against us because we have the iron fist. President Obama threat, set a red line to Syria, not to use chemical weapon. Crossing the red line would follow but attack. They crossed the red line. President Obama did not do what he pledged to do. President Trump had a red line and they uh, downed a sophisticated drone of the United States in the Gulf. What was the response? America already sent its airplanes to attack and the president stopped them for good reason. I think it's good not to, to go into these attacks, but I want to show you how it has been viewed from Iran. They viewed from Iran that they are frightened to us. Look at what's going on in the Gulf water. They are humiliating Americans. And someone who loves America, for me, is very disturbing to see what they are doing. So Iran is playing a game on the one side, trying to engage, on the other side, trying to show the limits. And I think that uh, here we are having this contrast in Iranian, Iranian policy and is a real challenge for the American policy. One thing is clo it's clear to me, I cannot make any predictions. The Iranians decided to wait until there is another administration or to wait until after the elections, even with the same administration. They don't want, want now, from my feeling, to engage in military, wide military operation. I think the same can be said about the United States. They are trying to push this issue aside because when you have on your table the corona and many other things, uh, you, uh, you don't want to go into this. But what is my concern? The Iranians are marching to their nuclear the bomb. Look at what the IAEA, the agency, International Agency of Nuclear Energy said. And they are not enemies of Iran. They are not hostile to Iran. They speak about what the Iranians are accomplishing under the mystery or secrecy of what's going post, post corona time. The corona has given them another advantage to do things which is close, close to the West. Say a word about, the, about Israel. Uh, and Israel is doing what it's supposed to do against the Iranians in Syria. And I think this is the thing that Israel should have done for years now. But Israel for years, raise the flag of the nuclear Iran. And today, you don't hear the Israelis speaking about Iranian nuclear threat. So probably because we cannot tell Americans what to do. My, my attitude was for a long time, and I said it also in ISGAP meetings, that the file of Iranian nuclear file is too big for us. The only country that can really effectively deal with this issue is the United States of America, hopefully with alliance with the European countries. Again, unfortunately, the European, the gap between the Europeans and the Americans is not anymore, uh, the civil relations are not as they used to be five years ago. And and the, the willingness of the Americans to raise this, this, this issue is more limited than it has been two or three years ago. And the, uh, for, for uh, the government of Israel today, 
the sovereignty over the West Bank and pushing the Iranians away from the borders in Syria is more important, it seems to be more important than the nuclear issue. To, si to sum up, I would say uh, that uh, Iran is in, in a very, uh, very tough situation. The, the conflicts within the people themselves, between the pragmatists and the, and the radicals, is huge. I'll give you a sentence in the Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister of Iran's speech in, uh, for the Iranian New Year in March. He said that we are, we have to do a cognitive overhaul of our policy. We mean to change entirely the policy, because this policy of uh, negation with the outside world is not going to help us for the longer run. I've never heard someone in his position saying such a critical uh, uh, statement against the policy. And he said, he said further that we need to get into dialogue to achieve the towns. Another uh, leading Iranian intellectual spoke similarly, and they speak about it's enough, it's, it's time for us to get away from this distinction between the people who are with us and people who are against us in Iran. We are all brothers, because the regime is doing this, this section. This, the reformists, the pragmatists are, as they say, uh, not from us. I, I don't know the translation into English, but in Yiddish they said, nicht unsere. They don't belong to us. There are people who are from us and people who are not from us. Stop with this distinction, but this distinction exists. A leading Iranian intellectual wrote that the reform, reformism passed away, but because of the corona, we couldn't have these burial ceremonies. So it's not dead, it's there, but it's weaker because power today is in the hands of the supreme leader. And here we see two, two sides. There's those who want change in America or in Iran don't have the power to do it. Those who have the power don't want to, to, to bring about the change. In the final sentence, I put this uh, title of the talk uh, between uh, maximum pressure and maximum, uh, maximum uh, pressure and maximum resistance. My intention was to do, to put another, to, to use another title, which I think explains what I want to say, what I've said in better terms. I think that the, what we are seeing is the weakness of the American strength vis-a-vis -vis the strength of Iranian weakness. And that's the way that I see it. Iran, which is weak, suddenly feels powerful and behaves powerful. And America, with all its powers, it doesn't show the Iranians. One more example, there was a red line, there was a threat not to, uh, 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 to be aware of the sanctions against Iran and Venezuela. Iran sent five tankers last month with oil to Caracas. What did America do? Now, maybe it's good that they didn't do anything, but I think against, don't threaten if you don't want to use these threats. And if viewed from Iran, it's sign of weakness. And so I think that the people who want change in Iran have to look at the people of Iran who I think are the best to produce a change. They can do it no, there is no uh, sign of any time that this will happen. Thank you.
Thank you very much, David. Uh, thanks for a good overview of a, a fascinating and uh, important situation. So I want to start with a quick question and then we'll open it up to other people who are sending in questions. Um, so one of the things that you didn't really touch on in detail in your presentation, and um, it's more of a question, it would seem to me from my uh, amateur perspective that Iran is very much engaged in military, uh, perhaps they're overextended, they're in Syria, they're in Iraq, they're in Yemen, um, Lebanon, Gaza, they're, they're in many places and it must be very expensive for them to maintain uh, this military intervention all over the region. Um, at the same time, so that's going on. The same time, as you said, the IAEA is um, criticizing Iran's nuclear weapons development in a very significant way. So Iran is attacking Western uh, American allies. They're, they're overextended militarily. They're violating uh, nuclear agreements and they're, they're proceeding with their development of a nuclear weapon. So perhaps my, my question is, and, and they are, as you were saying, they're weak. The, the currency is very low. There's, there's uh, social and economic problems in the country and that must be creating pressure on the regime. So the question is, if not now, when? When will the West say it's enough? I mean, they, they are, they're not violating agreements and international law and international sovereignty a little bit. They're, they're, it's open season. So is it only up to the Israelis and some uh, partners in the region to stand up to them? It seems Israel is stepping up its uh, operations if we read in the newspapers. So is it all up to Israel to, to fight this war? Or do you think that the United States and the West will defend its allies, many of its allies, and stop these flagrant violations of agreements and international law? Well, uh, Charles, you opened the, uh, uh, you know, this uh, meeting for another, another uh, points to raise for another lecture. But I try to be very brief. Okay, and we have many questions. So I don't want you are, to. Take you are you are very right in, uh, I think all that you said. Uh, I'd come to the questions later because I don't, I'm not sure I have answers. I think the Iranians have stretched their muscles beyond their capabilities. You know, they're spending in Syria billions of dollars a year. If you think about, they are, you know, they are saying that because of the sanctions, they don't have medication for the children. Come on, from the money that you are spending in Syria, Yemen, Lebanon, Iraq, give them medication, give them food. Who stopped you? Who stopped you? The Americans don't stop them to buy medication. It's more difficult for them to buy, but they, they're not under the embargo. So it is the situation is like this, that even the Iranian people in their demonstration in the last two years raised these slogans, why should I care about Gaza and Lebanon? My life should be sacrificed for the case of Iran. And that's, the voices are there, but they are being suppressed. You know, the Iranians have this phrase saying, nothing succeeds like suppress. Uh, it's, uh, 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 and the world doesn't say anything. And the people are demonstrating. You saw that, you know, many people ask why there was no uh, Arab Spring in Iran. You know, the Arab Spring in 2011. Well, for one thing, Iran is an Arab country. But Iran was the first country to have the Arab Spring in 2009 just two years before, in much more massive way. Iran had the Islamic revolution in, in Iran. The Iranian people are always active. Look at the, you know, demonstrations in two, uh, January 2020. Students in universities in Iran made sure they don't step on American and Israeli flags. You know, in Iran, people who go to the, the, the to enter the university, they enter offices, they must step on the American and Israeli flag. And these students were going beyond, around these flags. So showing their uh, disillusionment with these slogans. So there are difficulties, financial issues, it's, it's really 
we cannot even go into detail. And by the way, more than, more than the sanctions, there is corruption, mismanagement. It's not all because of the sanctions and the, and the, and the, and the United States. Now, it's who's, uh, who's to, to deal with this issue? I, 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 I tell you again, I think that the Israeli, Israelis, well, Israel has signaled to the world that it's Israel that should raise this flag. For maybe five, six years or more, everything we said is about the nuclear issue. And what was my fear, and I said it many, many times much before, we have a dilemma. If we don't speak about the Iranian nuclear deal, people will forget about it. If we speak about it, they think it's our problem. And therefore, we should take care of it. We should have found a way to signal to the world that this is their responsibility. It's too heavy for us. More than 10 years ago, I had a conference, a session at Tel Aviv University, Center of Iranian Studies, in which we brought in addition to two professors, two generals to speak. The for, former commander of the Air Force and former commander of the intelligence. And I came back home and my wife asked me, so what they say the generals about uh, the military option? I said, I don't know what they say, but I told you what I, I, I can tell you what I understand, that there is no military option. It's, it's very, very difficult for a small country like Israel, maybe today, mainly today, to do this thing. For this, you need to have an international consensus, coalition. You should have, you should have bring Europe closer to the United States. The Iranians are depending on Europe. They are seeing in them as the saviors of, of their revolution. And I think that many things should be done, but uh, we can deal, Israel can deal with pushing the Iranians from our borders. And this was successful. Just last month, we heard that the Iranian troops has, have withdrawn from close to our border back into Iraq. We can manage with them. We can manage with the Hamas, Hezbollah, and the West Bank, although it's not going to be easy, even if there is it simultaneously. But the issue of Iran is something which is not only problem of Israel, is of the problem of the region, the United States, and the world. So it not, should not be trust, entrusted in the hands of the Israeli to do, it's too big. Do you think that the shifting geostrategic military relations in the region could pose a more potent opposition to Iran's being overextended at this moment? Well, you know, there is, a ch there is change. But the change working on two directions. It's not one way. Israel managed to have good relations and credit should go to the Prime Minister Netanyahu and all the other uh, agencies uh, that worked on it to bring Saudi Arabia in Israel, U uh, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, and others with Israel. So the Gulf states are today much more willing to cooperate. And I know that the United Arab Emirates disclosed that uh, their country, although not on government level, but uh, uh, companies level, they are doing uh, some cooperation with Israel to find vaccine to the, to the corona. That's wonderful. On the other hand, we have this question of the West Bank and the Palestinian issue. It is true that they are less uh, expressing less resentment and emotions against the Israeli moves, less that could have been expected a few years ago. But still, it's very difficult for a country like Saudi Arabia or the Emirates to accept an accession while with the, with the blessing of the Emirates or Saudi Arabia. Mainly when you have Jordan in the middle, that is very much against, 
and Egypt that is against, but less, uh, not, the temperatures are not as high as one could have expected not a long time ago. And this really policy should be based on this calculation. It's not only Iran, we have the regional issue. There are so many good things that happening on regional level, and we have to take advantage of them in uh, cooperation with the regional countries. Thank you. So we have a question. It's an anonymous question. I suspect from, he's a Persian friend of ours. He said that it was predicted that increasing pressure by the United States and encouraged by Israel would make the moderates within Iran lose ground and that the radicals would increase their control. Shouldn't American policy, or isn't American policy short-sighted? Well, let me not get into compliment with uh, the American policy or Israeli policies. Speak about what, what is the situation. I think the gentleman or woman who asked this question is right. You know, I, I often uh, speak about it and uh, I said that, you know, the Iranians are very good in two things and the known in the world for two things. One is weaving carpets, you know, they're making the best carpets. And second, it is believed that chase was invented in Iran. So what is the difference? When you're weaving a, car a carpet, you think about each small dot and you play chess, you think about the strategy. The Iranians are good in both. And I think, and I have even written about it, they have the policy of their opponents is, if you want, you can call it short-sighted. It certainly doesn't look few steps ahead. Okay, you withdrew from the nuclear deal. What do you expect the Iranians to do? To withdraw? No, why should they? They stayed in the deal and take the benefits. If you step away from it, then you cannot use it. You are inside, but behave as though you are outside and you enjoy it from the two worlds. So Iranians are really good politicians uh, and they are, they are really looking uh, long-term and the policy of the, of, the, uh, of the Western countries in this case, I would say that maybe Americans or Israelis, you need to think from one election to another election. And I think that a, a country like Iran with the tradition of running an independent state, 25 millennia, it's, uh, it's the, their, 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 their calculations are different. Let's say my point. Iran is an expert in fishing in muddy waters. They have achieved their success in the region, and you, uh, Charles, you mentioned <coughs> some of them from Yemen to Lebanon. Their achievements were not because of the attraction of Iran as a prototype of a wonderful state or regime. They achieved, their achievement was because someone else prepared the ground for them, and the someone else are the foreign countries. They were successful where the central government collapsed, like in Lebanon, because of the Palestinians, the Syrians, and the Israeli intervention, in Syria, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, in Iraq. So what led to the Iranian so-called success is the collapse of the nation state or the malfunctioning of the nation states that opened the ground to the Iranians and they knew how to use it, to use the, to, to do it. They saw that in Syria, the, uh, their policy is not going well in 2013. They brought in Russia. The idea that Iran would bring Russia into involving in Syria is impossible to believe from Iranian, for people who deal with, learn, study Iran. And what happened next? They allowed 
Russian military airplanes to land in Iranian airports in the world to attack Daesh, the Islamic State. It was stopped after a day or two because of the resentment in Iranian parliament. We are against foreign involvement and then we allow Russian airplanes to land in our military airports. So it's, it's again, Iran is very complex and there are such different views. The bottom line is to respond to this question is that yes, their policy is much more sophisticated. So David, there's a question from Murray Rubin. He asks, if Iran would get nuclear weapons, should Israel attack them first as Iran calls for the destruction of Israel? What would Israel do if Iran had the bomb? Is, is, that, is the question you say? From Murray Rubin, if Iran gets nuclear weapons, should Israel attack it first as Iran is calling for Israel's annihilation? I tell you, I... You say it should Israel attack first? Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think so because I don't think is, is Israel capable of doing it. it. It is capable. It is capable. But there are, it, it, we are admitting that it's only our problem. That should be a, a policy of the, of, the, of the free world. Why expecting Israel to do it? I, I don't understand it. Maybe we spoke about Iran so much and people identify the Iranian nuclear issue with the Israelis. No, you, you know, it's a, uh, and even if Israel, you know, I was very much against the Israeli statements about Iran. You know about it. I think that's, we are speaking too much. These talks actually lead to such questions. And maybe one day Israel should do something. I'll tell you, I'm not supporter of Iran becoming nuclear in militarily. Why? There are many reasons, but I'll give you one example. The president of Iran, Ahmadinejad, upon his election in 2005, went to the UN, spoke to the General Assembly, and he came back, he was reporting to a leading Ayatollah in Iran. And he said that during the 27 minutes that I was speaking in the UN, no one whispered. It's like God has given the Torah to Israel that was silent. Was silent. Was no, no one, no, because he said, no one even moved or whispered because I, they told me there was a light, hell of light above my head with God protection. People who speak such a language cannot come close to the button of nuclear weapon. So I don't think Iran should have it. And they don't say they want to have it, but all signs show they are marching to this distinction. If in 2005, when they struck this JCPOA, they were one year uh, away from nuclear power, nuclear military power, Today, they are six months. Now, six months, as I said earlier, is the time that they don't want to do anything until after the elections. If you don't stop them in these six months, you will have a new, new president or the same president re-elected, but with Iran in much closer, if not in, with nuclear, nuclear weapon. So, David, there's a few more questions, but very quickly, in response to what you said, so in a sense, Israel is saying it's not an Israeli problem, it's a global problem. And I completely agree with you. If Iran with a nuclear weapon could create havoc uh, in all sorts of levels for all sorts of nations and interests and people and minorities, it'd be a, a big issue. But isn't, if we go back to a, an Israeli or even a Jewish perspective, is, isn't, isn't Zionism about the self-determination of the Jewish people and that the, the fundamental ethos of Zionism is that we will take our fate into our own hands, regardless of the, the immense challenge this is. Isn't it, in a sense, is it our responsibility? To, you know, Europe uh, has let us down historically many times. This would not be the first time if they abandoned Israel and the Jews. So what do we do in that case? Do we have a... I'll a tell you what, I, I, I'm not going to directly answer this question. Okay. But I can tell you what I say to prominent Israeli officials. I gave them an example for a movie that I liked very much, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. 
you remember that? I don't know the viewers of this program if they are what age they are. And there is a sentence there in which he says, if you need to shoot, shoot, don't talk. Yeah. And I think that they, don't, they cannot expect people to tell you what they are going to do. You are threatening more with not threatening than with waving with this threat all the time. I, I, I don't believe that Iran will have nuclear the, the, uh, uh, military power, they will use it. But you know, the problem of Israel is say, what if they do? 20, 30 years ago, in, 2000, in 1990, after Iraqis invaded Kuwait, it was this Gulf, the first Gulf War, as you say. I was in meetings in Israel in which we discussed if the Iraqis are going to send missiles against Israel or no, and if they're sending missiles, would it be chemical weapon or not? Some said yes, some said no. Ultimately, they sent missiles. Many people themselves thought that they would not dare. So I don't, I don't want that the destiny of the Jewish state of Israel will be in the hands of people who say that Israel should be eliminated from the map of the world. So that's again calls for more coordination, cooperation between the countries of the, of the free world and to find a way to negotiate. I think the easier way in my view is to deal with the Iranians rather than ignore them. They've shown in the past that they were willing to do it the, 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 there was a nuclear deal made. Unfortunately, it did not go back uh, much uh, far. And the nuclear deal proved to the radicals in Iran that they were right. They said, you cannot trust America. They will stab you in the back. They are not to be faithful to their commitments. That's all that they said before the nuclear deal. And now they go around and say, we told you. So I think that there are still people with reason in Iran. The issue of compromising with enemies is not alien to the Islamic revolution. And maybe it is the end of more or less the, our meeting, session. I'll tell you that Ayatollah Khomeini, who the founding father of the Islamic revolution, issued a religious decree in 1987, during the war between Iraq and Iran, in which he said, for the well-being of the people, it's forbidden to destroy a mosque and to eliminate the five major commitments of the Muslims, prayer, hajj, uh, uh, and, and more. What uh, more than that you want? That's, here is the tension that we, the Iranians are faced with. The ideology of the revolution or the interest, or the interest of who? The interest of the revolution, the interest of the regime, or the interest of the people who are at the top of it. So there are problems in Iran. And then two years later, Ayatollah Khomeini appeared on TV and he said that, I told you eight years, war, war, until victory with Iraq, but we don't have a choice. And I think that that's the situation that we have to go to show them for their best interest, it's better for them to change. As, but I'm optimistic, no, because when you have the system that you have in the United States, in Iran, sorry, that the supreme leader is above everything and is unwilling to entertain such ideas, all these liberals, uh, reformist moderates cannot do much. Thank you, David. There's a few more questions. I'd like to go through them quickly before the time ends. Uh, Stephen Mize asks, given that the youth of the Iranian population is quite large, does, it, does this create an inherent instability for the regime? Do you see Iranian youth as the eventual uh, cause of the fall of the regime? Well, uh, I've said it a long time, I've written about it. If there is hope, for change in Iran is in the hands of the Iranian youth. Iran is a very young society. 
And the young people want to have good life. You know, in the early days of the revolution, there were, uh, before the hostage taking, 79, November 79, there were graffitis on the walls of the Iranian, of the American embassy in Tehran. And that's I heard from one of the hostages. Uh, he said that uh, one of the graffitis said, Yankees go home. And someone wrote under it in Persian, and take me with you. <laughs> that's how much they hate America. Don't, they, they are dying to a visa to the United States. They can say death to America, death to America, when they, they want to drink, they, they drink uh, Coke. So it's, this is the, the strange thing that we see, see in Iran. The, uh, Iran has the, is the only country which has heritage, which has tradition of popular engagement in politics and making the difference. It goes back from the late 19th century with the beginning of national movement in Iran, late 19th century. Iran is the only country in the Middle East which had two big revolutions in the 20th century. To remind you, there are not many countries that had two big revolutions in one century. Maybe Russia, maybe China. I don't see more. Uh, so, and the people have done it on the streets. The Islamic Revolution, 1979, the Constitutional Revolution in, 90, in uh, 1906, and in between, you so saw 2009, 2017, 2019, 2020, people going to the streets and demonstrating. The best way I can explain this, this clash between the two movements, the popular movement and the institutions, 30 years ago, no, I'm historian. 30 years ago is yesterday. So for the, your viewer here, maybe it's prehistory. There was a, in 1999, Iranian students demonstrated for freedom in Iran and they were crushed. And then Ayatollah wrote an article in the Iranian newspaper calling the young students to obey the rules not to cross red lines and to be faithful to true Islam. A young student whom I don't know, but we professors usually also learn from, from students, not only teach them, but this student wrote an article with the title, Father, the society is young. The society was only the name, also the name of the journal. And he said, you preach us to obey, to follow true Islam. Would you tell us how many Islams are there? Which one is true? Which one is false? And who decides? And the punchline was at the end. The problem is not that we, the young people, in a, a crossing certain unidentified red lines, the problem is that you, the Ayatollahs, in the one-way street, you are driving against the flow of traffic. If you say, ask me how I see the social picture in Iran, that's the way that I see it. The people want to breathe. The people want freedom. The revolution was not about creation of Islamic regime. The revolution was about uh, giving their children basically three things, social justice, political justice and their dignity, bread, uh, freedom, and dignity. And they have not yet achieved these three things. So I think that the, the stabilization of the Islamic regime would come not as much as because of how much the Iranian government is faithful to their dogma, but how much is capable of resolving the misery of the people on two major issues, welfare and freedom. Thank you, David. Final question, we just have a couple more minutes. I'm not gonna be able to get everybody's question in, I'm sorry. But the final question is from our colleague, Rami Aziz, and he asks, if Joe Biden is elected as a president in the upcoming American elections, do you think that the US will restore the nuclear agreement with Iran 
um, especially since there are European powers that would like the return to the agreement. How will this affect uh, the situation? Mr. Aziz, you know, Aziz in Arabic Persian is dear. So dear Mr. Aziz, uh, I, I'm, I was trained as an historian. I don't know the future. Uh, I always remember when I was young and uh, we were young and uh, my grandmother was very upset of us she usually used to say that these days, even the future is not what it used to be. In my age, uh, to foresee the, students, the future is impossible. The question should be turned to, I hope, uh, ISGAB will bring an American expert, and there are many of them, to, uh, to answer you about American policy. I'm not an expert on American policy. I can tell you that the Iranians expect that with Biden, because of his involvement with the nuclear, uh, nuclear deal and his close relations with the previous administration, they can have better, better discussion. Whether or not Supreme Leader would allow it this time as he did 2003, 2013, I don't know. But from the American side, probably it will be easier for the Democrat uh, uh, government, the administration, to deal with Iran more than with Trump. Although I would tell you, go and see what President Trump said just two weeks ago, with the following the swap of, uh, of uh, prisoners. Then see what the President Trump said about North Korea. So it's not entirely impossible that this administration, if continued, they also would like to do so it's, we have seen so many changes, so many rapid, radical changes that everything can happen. From perspective of the Iranians, it's much more, uh, the, the Biden is more reliable partner than, uh, than President Trump, but they do not decide the results of the elections in your country. And as you have to decide, and I think that both, the, no matter who is being elected, I think the best way is to try and engage Iran and try and make a regional agreement, not only on the nuclear deal, but on regional issues. And Iran, for the sake of itself, should, should stop its engagement in countries like Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Iraq, Venezuela, and all other countries, and try and give their people what they deserve, freedom and welfare. Cool, so on that good note, on a positive note, David, thank you very much for your insights and wisdom on a very important subject or subjects. So thanks for taking your time and being with us. And this actually marks the end of our regular seminar series. We're gonna take a break. We will have seminar series on occasion as issues arise in the next few weeks. But we're also preparing for our summer uh, institute. We usually have a, the Oxford Summer Institute where we train professors to create courses on, uh, uh, cr and curriculum on, a, on contemporary anti-Semitism. So the opening evening of that event will be on Sunday, August the 9th. And we're gonna make it available uh, to the public. So everybody is welcome to come. And then we're gonna have the Summer Institute which will be closed for professors during the week. But Sunday, August the 9th, you can mark it into your calendars. Everybody will be welcome to have to see the keynote events and speeches of the opening night, which will include Natan Sharansky and other uh, leading uh, international figures. I'll leave it at that for now, but it will be something special. And we'll send out notices about the event. So everybody uh, stay safe uh, as the second wave is hitting certain parts of the world and uh, enjoy the summer months. And David, thank you so much. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. And David, we can stay on the line for a minute. I have to go so I can call you later on. Okay.